Hello everyone, thank you for sticking with us that late in the day. So my name is Niels, um, I'm a security researcher at Kudelski Security. I focus on privacy and I like to process uh, large data sets and I'm a huge Linux fan. And today I'm also here my, with my colleague uh, Marco. Hello, I'm Marco Macchetti. I work as a cryptographer for Kudeski Security, and my background is hardware design, cryptanalysis, and applied cryptography in general. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, this is a new attack that we devised against uh, uh, an algorithm to generate digital signatures, which is called ECDSA. And it's, it's well known for being the, the digital signature algorithm beyond the Bitcoin blockchain. This attack is called Polynos, and we will give you some details of the attack and the things we tried to put it in practice, how we did it, and what we learned uh, in the process. And there will be a brief demo, and then we will give also some results and takeaways. Let's head over to the introduction. What is a, a digital signature? Well, basically, a digital signature is just a proof of knowledge of a private key. Right, everyone can verify your signatures with your public key, but only you can generate signatures with the private key. So in a real world, uh, your signature on a piece of paper is a proof of identity. In the digital world, the knowledge of your private key is a proof of identity. And on blockchains, the private key means ownership of the coins. So everyone will try to steal your key uh, if it's on backups, paper notes, brain wallets, and sometimes it's, it's a strong key, but it's protected with a weak password. Uh, digital signatures are mildly complex objects. Uh, a signature algorithm is, is actually a set of three algorithms. You have key generation, signature generation, and verification. Is there randomness inside all of this? Well, yes. Essentially, key generation is uh, throwing the dice to obtain your key pair, and uh, randomness is also uh, uh, present in the signature generation process along with your private key and the message. You throw the dice again and you obtain a signature. And verification is just a deterministic algorithm. Well, if everyone wants your private key, is it possible to obtain your private key just by looking at the signatures? Well, in general, no. But under some assumption, yes. For example, if you generated the key with low entropy or with short seeds or using a brain wallet, maybe it's easy to guess. But provided that the key is properly generated, is it possible to obtain it uh, from your signatures? Well, remember there is randomness in the signature generation, so there is more attack surface that we can explore. Uh, in this paper, we, we target the ECDSA algorithm. This is probably the mostly deployed uh, algorithm for digital signatures. EC is for elliptic curve, and elliptic curve is just a curve on a finite field with some parameters. Uh, you all know the Bitcoin curve. And a curve is also a set of points. You can perform operation with the points. You can add the points or multiply a point times a scalar. This is called scalar point multiplication. And why it is so useful? Because scalar point multiplication, it's easy to do in one direction, but it's hard to invert. And this is called the discrete logarithm problem. And this is the basis of the security for ECDSA. So what is in detail the, um, the set of algorithms for ECDSA? Well, key generation is quite simple. You just pick an integer, D, in a certain range, and this is your private key. And the public key, you just obtain it through scalar point multiplication. To generate a signature, you hash the message first, and then again, you have to pick an integer in, a, in the same range. Again, uniformly at random, and this is called the nonce, and you have to, to have a different no, nonce for each signature. Then the, the signature is just two numbers, R and S, and R is just the X coordinate of the point uh, which corresponds to your nonce, and S is obtained with the expression that is in the slide. And verification is just a deterministic algorithm we are not very interested. So the takeaway is that you're also performing key generation for every signature, basically. And if the nonces uh, can be predicted or, or some bits are known, then you can use lattice attacks. And you can also use uh, side channel attacks in combination with lattice attacks to retrieve the key. So what you have to choose to, to generate this, the randomness is to choose your dice. Uh, there are good dice like uh, those uh, RNGs based on cryptographic algorithms like HMAC and AES. These are the good ones. And then you have bad ones like algebraic generators, LFSRs. 
And then there are the awful ones like a fixed secret constant, the run functions, and these kind of things. And once you choose the dice, you also have to seed it with entropy. Let's pick one of the bad RNGs, the linear congruential generator. This is, has been known for decades. I mean, it's a, it's a generator that is implemented basically everywhere. It's in GMP, other libraries, and it was also refer, re, referenced from the NIST documentation. Basically, an SCG works in this way. You generate a random number, and then you apply a linear relation to obtain new numbers with known coefficients A and B. There is no bias in this, so it's good, but uh, in fact, it has been shown by, by previous projects that you can use lattice attacks uh, to retrieve the private key. So if your SCG is not full state, but it's 128-bit, uh, for example, for the Bitcoin curve, then with as low as 22 signatures, you can get the private key. But here we want to go beyond. What if you use a full state LCG? Uh, there are no results published so far on this. And what if you increase the degree to quadratic or even cubic? Then lattice attacks are not possible. And what if you keep the coefficients unknown, secret? Then you, you may think you are safe, right? But in fact, no, we show that with polynomials we can retrieve the private key in a fraction of a second. So how does it work? Basically, we don't care about the R part of the signature, but we just look at the S part of the signature. And we rewrite the expression of S to be a linear relationship between the nonce and the private key. What does it mean? It means that there is only one secret behind all your signatures. You can think that it's the private key, or you can think that it's one of the nonces, or maybe some partial information on more nonces. And uh, so, we want to exploit this, this additional information that is uh, in the S part of the signatures. How can we do it? Basically, suppose that you are, gen you are generating your nonces with an LCG. So you generate a first nonce K0, and then you generate K1, K2, K3 in this way. And suppose that the attacker doesn't know uh, A1 and A0. These are the secret coefficients. But basically, what we can do, we can subtract the second equation from the first and the third from the second, and we get this pair of equations here. And then we can solve for A1 in both, and we can just equate the results, and we get this expression here. And we got a completely rid of the unknown secret coefficients. And then, this is the trick, we can replace every nonce in this polynomial with the expression in D the static private key. So basically we get a polynomial which, where the only unknown is D. We find the roots of the polynomial, it's easy to do, and we get the private key. And uh, we extended this to all n degree polynomial relationships, so we, we are able to attack quadratic and cubic and higher degrees. And this is a recursive algorithm, it's a fast generic, it's not using lattice, and uh, if you want to take a look, there is an ePrint paper on this. And then I add over to Nis, who will explain uh, how we put this into practice. Thank you, uh, Marco. So with all of that, how can we actually attack things in practice? Well, to, to run the polynance attack, what you will need is at least four signatures, but that's for the linear case. If you want to target a higher degree relation, then you'll need more than four signatures. In any case, you'll need to make sure that these signatures are sorted by the time in which they have been generated. On top of that, you'll need to also have associated with each signature the message and the public key. If you have all of that and the nonces were indeed generated in a biased way, then you can retrieve the private key. So where can we find ECDSA signatures in practice? Well, one good source of that is Bitcoin. Uh, in Bitcoin, you have blocks, and inside blocks, you have transactions. And these transactions, they contain inputs and outputs. And good for us, these inputs are signed with ECDSA. So how do we get what we need? Well, the public key and the signature, they are contained in that input. The message, however, you have to compute it. 
And computing that message is a very error-prone and under-documented process. Um, you will need to use uh, fields from the current transaction, but also fields from previous transactions. So you will need to keep track of all of that to compute the message. So to actually get the data, what you'll need is to let your Bitcoin client sync and download the whole chain. And we did that, it took about a day, and we got all of the blocks until September last year. And when it was synced, we dumped all of the signatures, the pop keys, the messages, by just reading the block files from disk. And um, we, with that, we dumped about 700 uh, million signatures. We only covered the most common type of Bitcoin signature, which is pay to public key hash signatures, but that covers more than half of the, the Bitcoin transactions. Another good source is Ethereum, because transactions in Ethereum are also signed with ECDSA. And in that case, the signature is directly in the transaction. The public key, not directly, but there is actually a, a lesser known feature of ECDSA called ECDSA Recover that you can use to compute the public key based on the signature and the message plus a third value that I won't discuss, but which is in the transaction. The message also must be computed. To compute the message, the main challenge here is that Ethereum has multiple protocol versions. And these versions uh, change based on the block number, meaning if you want to compute the message for a specific transaction, depending on what block this is, the way you compute the message changes. So if you want to dump all of the signatures for the whole chain, you basically have to implement all of these Ethereum versions of the protocol. So we did that. Um, if you want to have a look at the details, please check out our code. It's on GitHub. To actually get the data, you'll need two things. An execution client first, such as GEF, and a consensus client, such as Lighthouse. You let these two sync so that it downloads the whole chain. For us, that took about three weeks and a ton of disk space. But then we got all of the blocks until October last year when we did that. We used the JSON RPC API of the execution client to get the blocks directly parsed in JSON and dumped the signatures, pop keys, and messages to a file. And um, we dumped 1.7 billion signatures that way. We also had a look at two more signature, uh, sorry, two more sources that are not blockchain related. The first is a sample of TLS servers. So why TLS servers? Well, if you make a TLS handshake with a server, it's going to send you um, a signature. And if the key is an ACDSA key, you get an ACDSA signature. So that's what we collected. The second one is actually a set of data sets from the Minerva attack. These are publicly available, and these are ECDSA signatures that were generated from TPMs, smart cards, and um, a bunch of software libraries. So a few stats. Um, here at the top, you see that about 97% of Bitcoin wallets only generated three signatures or less. And at the bottom, for Ethereum, this is a bit less extreme, but only 77% of wallets generated, um, um, well, 77% of wallets generated less than four signatures. The rest, however, so those that have at least four signatures, we can try to attack. And that means there's at least a few million wallets we can try to break with that attack. So we implemented the attack in Sage, and it's a multi-threaded implementation. The code is out there on, on GitHub. So just a quick demo. So here we, we start um, 
a TLS server, which is vulnerable, it's, it's going to generate biased uh, nonces. We capture the network traffic, dump it to um, a PCAP file, then we make TLS handshakes to that vulnerable server. We stop the capture, stop the server, then we read the traffic from that PCAP file and dump the signatures, messages, and public keys to a CSV file. And finally, we run the attack against the signatures in that file. And that's it. We got the private key here. So how did it go? Well, no, we didn't drive in in a new Ferrari today. Um, well, for, for Bitcoin and Ethereum, we used a big machine with lots of cores. And for Bitcoin, the attack ran for about two days. And we were able to get the private key of about 700 wallets. But none of these had any money on them. So it looks like someone else had drained them before us. For Ethereum, we processed about 20% of the input file in two days, and we only got two private keys. So we stopped it because we thought that the cost-time ratio was not really worth it. Um, these two also had a zero balance here. It turns out that all of the signatures that we used, that, that were generated by these vulnerable wallets, um, actually had repeated nonces. And of course, the polynonce attack is also going to find repeated nonces because that's just a particular case of an LCG where the last um, unknown coefficient is the only one which is non-zero and it's equal to that repeated nonce value. But this could also have been found with a simpler attack. For the two others, TLS and Minerva, um, this was actually pretty quick, so just a few seconds for the TLS set we had, and for Minerva, a few uh, hours. So you could just run this on a laptop. We did a N equals four, five, and six signatures because it was quick, but we got no success successful attacks there. So we wanted to see what happened to those stolen Bitcoin. And we tracked that, and we found that about 140 bitcoins were sold in, in total. So that's about 10 million USD at Bitcoin speak price. We also saw that some of the addresses that received that stolen money had readable names in them, like one hack, one gift, something like this. And there is one, uh, one idiot address that sent the money it stole to another address called One Andreas. And this address is owned by a guy who made significant contributions to the Bitcoin ecosystem. And when people found out about this in 2017, they decided to make a ton of donations to that guy. So it looks like the one idiot guy stole Bitcoin to give it back to this guy as a donation for charity. And we also saw on some public forums that people had been saying like how many Bitcoin they stole due to uh, repeated attacks, uh, repeated nonsense attack just publicly on a forum like, oh, I have collected seven Bitcoin so far. So a few takeaways. Make sure you don't generate uh, signatures with the biased nonce. And to make sure you don't do that, you should use something that does deterministic nonce generation, such as deterministic ECDSA or EDDSA. We just barely scratched the surface here. So there's plenty of other areas that we didn't touch and that you could apply this attack on. And it's very easy for you to check your own wallet. Um, you don't need to have the whole chain if you just have the signatures for your wallet, the pub key, and the message. You can run this on your laptop, basically. So for more research from our team, please visit our blog. 
We have more exciting research on this topic, and we hope that people get more secure by releasing our code. It's public, it's on GitHub, please check it out. Um, and thank you. Do you have any questions?